Welcome to AI, Government and the Future, a podcast by Corner Alliance. We explore the intersection of artificial intelligence, government and the future with your host, Alan Pence. We work with government to create results. We ignite your agency's mission by helping you to design and implement high impact and innovative federal programs in AI, broadband, cybersecurity, public safety, and more. Being a government ally is at the core of all we do. Introducing your host, Alan Pence. Excellent. Today, welcoming to the pod, Andreas Braun. He's a director at PwC Luxembourg for AI and data science and extensive background working with private sector and public sector clients in Europe. And he's also an expert on smart identity, biometrics, and has several patents and publications to his name. So that's pretty impressive. You might be one of our first guests with that kind of background. And he's here today to talk a little bit about how AI and governments are going to work together and where we see this field going. So Andreas, welcome to the podcast, and it's great to have you here. Thanks, Alan. Thanks for having me. It's my pleasure. Excellent. So tell us a little bit about your background and how you got from a robot soccer team at university to PwC. Yes, as you mentioned, I was briefly joining the soccer playing robots team at my university when I was doing my, uh, let's say, undergraduate studies in computational engineering. And my goal was to make the robots fall a little bit less because it was those tiny humanoid robots. It didn't work out quite well, but let's say that always spiked my interest in robotics and computer graphics, which I focused for a while before joining Fraunhofer and then also doing my PhD in sensor data processing, all within in Darmstadt, Germany. And I stayed there for 10 years, uh, leading a research group that was fo- uh, working on biometric technologies and smart city technologies. And then around five years ago, I was joining PwC Luxembourg as an expert on both biometrics and artificial intelligence. And currently I'm leading a team of around 10 data scientists and AI specialists that provide consultancy services to public sector and private sector and financial sector clients in Luxembourg and beyond. Interesting. It's a great background. So tell us a little bit about where you see public sector, particularly in Europe today with AI and machine learning. Like, what are they interested in? I mean, obviously we know there's a lot of regulatory talk, so that's part of it. But what are they actually interested in from like a use case actually using AI for positive outcomes? Europe is, uh, while while many small countries, but it's a big continent. So, of course, the interests of each of the different countries is a little bit different. But generally speaking, the public sector has similar challenges to the private sector in finding enough qualified personnel, in having the drive to improve efficiency because of financial constraints that they are even in all sectors of government. So they are looking at AI primarily as a driver for efficiency and to increase their digitalization effort. For example, cases are automated automating tax returns, ensuring, but also using at the same time AI to detect something that is potentially fraudulent or might require a second human look. Then one particular aspect about Europe is that's the multilingualism. So let's say if you are working, so the EU has 20 plus official languages and all of the texts have to be translated with one another. And while most people have a pretty good English knowledge, there is still is the need to work with many different languages. So translation services is a big topic where there is some investment even for smaller, more obscure languages like Luxembourgish, where machine translation is becoming more and more feasible thanks to large language models. And Lastly, so it's also about improving services at the same time. So let's say we are opening hours for many government uh, offices are usually quite short, but with the help of advanced chatbots, it will be possible to provide a lot of services to citizens around the clock and automating a lot of things that would rather require otherwise, let's say a lot of human effort. And in the end, I think also the broad topic of improving the quality of government services is also something that is of big interest. They are trying to also increase the quality of their own workers with the help of AI, but also to ensure that their need for rework, which is quite frequent, or doing the same procedures two, three, four 
X times because some documentation was missing or there was some clerical mistake at some point that this is reduced, therefore increasing also the operational efficiency of government services. That's fascinating. Yeah, I didn't thought as much about the like hours are short and you can do stuff off hours and whenever you need to. So that's a great addition. I hadn't thought about that. Particularly in Germany, at some point, hopefully it'll let you buy something on a Sunday. That would be really good too. I like that. There's always train stations, supermarkets, and gas stations uh, where sometimes you might get lucky. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> Not in Bavaria, though. So there's only praying on Sundays. That might have been in Bavaria, what I experienced. So maybe AI yeah, could help with that. So you articulated like a really good range of use cases. Are you seeing some of the resistance coming, like, hey, this is coming for our jobs kind of thing? Or are people seeing it, hey, we're so understaffed or overworked or whatever that this is a boon for us? So I think you will definitely have both types of reactions depending on what area of government jobs you are working in and uh, let's say how threatened your specific job is. So certain governments that are, let's say, less digitized will employ a lot of people for data entry jobs. So let's say taking the thousands, hundreds of thousands of paper documents that are sent in and transposing the data to some IT system where it is then processed further. And these are types of jobs that might likely be automated away thanks to improved OCR, improved AI methods together to read handwriting, etc. And therefore, these types of jobs might be threatened. But on the other hand, there are then case workers that have to have only so many hours a day, but have to deal with thousands of cases because of the lack of personal, and they would greatly benefit from some, yeah, let's say augmentation systems that will allow them to focus on the stuff that is really important while automating the less cognitively interesting tasks away. And for them, AI would be a real boon while others might feel threatened because let's say Government services are so broad in what they are doing, you will see all types of reactions uh, throughout the different countries and throughout the different services. Definitely. And then you kind of talked about, like, we see that here in the U.S., most of the use cases up until recently have been mostly automation, a lot of robotic process automation kind of stuff. And But since the dawn of ChatGPT just over a year ago, have you seen a shift in thinking about how AI is going to transform or a shift in maybe the use cases people are looking at? So I think that people have been starting to think about more use cases. So when you think about robotic process automation, in most of the times when a government agency looks at this, okay, this is interesting, but it requires, let's say, a full digital transformation of all of our service in order to then take benefit when we have digitized all steps of the way. With JetGPT, we are starting to think, of course, well, there are a couple of points coming into play. The first one I would mention is that, yeah, they see now that chatbots can be really powerful and not just, let's say, very minimal function things that are residing on your website and are just doing FAQ stuff, but they indeed can almost autonomously put, provide specific services. The second point is that indeed the cognitive work that you have to do, like, comparing, let's say, when we are doing legal, you're a caseworker in social security, so you always have to adhere to certain legal standards, operating procedures, and you then get the input from one of your citizens, and then you have to compare it to the legal text and then go back to the documentation provider, etc. So these are cognitively challenging things where you have to take bits and pieces from various different information sources. And with JetGPT, people are now thinking rightfully that, yeah, this is also a kind of task that can be strongly supported by JetGPT style technology. So it has expanded definitely also. So the range of use cases into saying that it could act as a real assistant or as the term is often used now, co-pilot. And the third point is that, yeah, it's also seen as a better RPA technology. So because of how flexible and how comprehensive many of those AI models are, you also think about that, well, what we considered RPA in the past is probably not what RPA is in the future because we can automate away more complex things or put things into an RPA tool chain that is much more complex than we what had in the past. That's fascinating. I hadn't thought about it that way. So I just talked to a guy, they have a company that is trying to build policy LLMs 
And it's kind of fascinating to me, this idea that say you're regulating airlines or food or whatever, you can now create this large language model of all the information about all the things in this area, all the history, and you can get to, hey, what do I need to do with this policy? Start looking at alternatives in such a more granular and fact-based in something like seconds where it would have taken years of study before. I mean, this seems to me to be revolutionary. Definitely is the case. So we have been also working on similar prototypes or also discussing with clients the case on what can we do in we have said a policy finding. So being inspired by what has been there in the past, like what you mentioned, we could have a large language models where we that we have trained with all of the past policies. But the one very important part about policies is that you want to achieve a future outcome. I mean, when you look at the past. All of the past policies may have not been successful. So therefore, maybe a different approach is required. And therefore, it's good to combine the capabilities of large language models, I would say, in in finding the inspiration and finding the sources to also with more predictive analytics type AI solutions that then are forward looking in simulating the potential outcome of what you are trying to establish so that you not only are doing the textual writing of the policies that might be very good and might sound very good, but that you also have that part where you estimate the outcomes of it. So which is a crucial part of policy. And we are, let's say, there are a lot of initiatives in in Europe around better policy making and always having these monitoring cycles on how did European or local legislation work or how did the European legislation work around this broad variety of member states in the EU and letting that flow back into and doing some AI supported simulation or AI supported prediction is something that is under strong investigation, but not quite ready yet for prime time. So I think, yeah, it's not quite there to be fully embedded into the political process, but certainly something that many people are looking into right now. So yeah, you kind of hit on a issue I've been thinking a little bit about here, which is all LLMs are sort of trapped by the past, right? They're trapped by what exists, right? Do you take a different approach when you're saying, hey, I want something that's going to be more, help me make a range of predictions about how something would perform in the future? I mean, really all you have is past data to judge that on, right? Yes. I mean, LLMs of a certain size, they are might be biased by what's in the past, but they might be biased by everything that in the past pretty much, right? So GPT-4 and these styles have been trained by pretty much the whole internet. And when we are thinking about how we would approach such things, we also would be inspired by what is in the past and then trying to see what might be the best one for the future. But on the other hand, you also may have heard of, let's say, not large language models, but there was a case of Google improving weather forecasting by bringing down or increasing the horizon in which you could do a precise forecast by a couple of days, thanks to a very powerful machine learning model. And of course, every major player in the financial sector is looking at what can we do the same for stock markets? And then, of course, the policymakers are looking at, well, can we do the same for policies? So these are still large neural networks, mod type models that do this type of forecasts, but they are not large language models, which have been indeed trained to generate well-sounding text based on what is in the past. So you would use AI, but you would not use the same LLM style for this predictive tasks, just because this is not what they have been trained to do. So therefore, it's just pick the right tool for your specific purpose. As the American writer William Faulkner said, though, like the past is not done with us. It's not even past. So it's sort of all AI is going to have to be grounded in the past in some way, right? Anyway, interesting point. So sort of this time last year, you had predicted that AI-supported content generation is going to be hitting the mainstream, right? You had had some use cases, right? Think about a text-generating tool that helps you when you get writer's block, a photo manipulation software that automatically generates a set of modifications for you to pick and choose from, drawing software that allows artists to quickly experiment with different styles. And then you kind of pose some questions like, are established players like Microsoft and Adobe ready to take on their up-and-coming competitors? Will the upcoming EU AI Act hurt or empower the market in the EU? So looking a year later, these are all you kind of on the mark. These are the main issues and most of it played out. So first, 
kind of reflect on that? How do you think most of that turned out? And then we'll talk a little bit about 24. As you mentioned, I think that the established players have, let's say, followed similar approaches. So let's say Microsoft tried to buy but was not successful in getting all of OpenAI. So they bought a big part of the share and uh, exclusivity rights. Hey, they almost got all the employees. They almost got all of the employees, but delve into that. That would be all another podcast. So Microsoft has this strong bond with OpenAI and has is already rolling out numerous AI tools from the co-pilots to Bing Chat to all of the different tools. And it's getting really deeply ingrained into all of their tool set. Adobe well, similarly failed to buy Figma, but that was more for, uh, let's say, monopoly reasons. But they also are investing a lot into, uh, I think, Fireflies is the name of their graphics generating model and embedding that into their PowerPoint and other creative suites. And it's uh, pro only a question of time until the video generating systems that we see popping up from various startups, also similar technologies being integrated into the big tools. So we see that kind of, I would say right now, the tools are somewhat prevailing or the big players are prevailing, but it requires from them massive investment and a very speedy revamp of their tool set, I would say. So nobody would have expected a year ago that Microsoft already has now this completely new assistant technology embedded into all of their Office products. Nobody would have foreseen that Adobe also has all of the AI tools embedded into their suites. And so the speed in which also the big players are moving is, I would say, almost mimicking the speed of in which startups are working on AI. With the AI Act, as you probably know, it just has been agreed upon and we will see the final text in a couple of weeks. I also haven't seen it and I didn't want to ruin my Christmas break with looking at very long commented 700 page versions of it. But still to be seen, it seems like the compromise that was found seems reasonable. But also there was, a, let's say, a very last minute push by many of the bigger European member states, France, Germany and Italy, to soften some of the rules in order to not strangle the local startup scene and then to potentially leave the chance open for competitor to open AI and similar solutions. Because yeah, for those member states in particular felt like that... Europe already lost the internet game. Europe lost the cloud game pretty much. And now if you are over regulating AI, have we already lost that one as well? So very fair questions, but it's not only about the regulation. There's also, of course, you need the manpower, the brains. You need, of course, the investment, the amount of money, which is much slimmer in Europe. So there are many different ways in which Europe would have to adapt their approach a little bit in order to move to be a successful competitor around AI. Well, so I guess the question is, did Mistral save AI in the EU because France had a national champion? That was sort of like the cynical American view, right? Let's say, I mean, it's, there was Mistral in France, there is Aleph Alpha in Germany, and they are all well connected politically, but also to the startup scene uh, across the ocean. So therefore, I think there was a certain interest, but also some of the provisions in these uh, drafts of the AI that were, have been floating around about the regulation of those foundation models were, were quite strong and could have prevented even, let's say, open source providers from doing anything competitive. So... Of course, it's about the commercial part. Mistral, as you know, is trying to be yeah, somewhere in between the open source community and the commercial ones. So right now, pushing the open source part very much while in the background training their commercial models and hopefully then eventually making money with those. But it will be interesting to watch how that develops over the coming years, if we will have much of the startup scene left or if they all have been swallowed on around Gen AI or if they all will be swallowed up by the big IT companies. Yeah, it's interesting because what I've been hearing is more like this is a sustaining innovation, right? Where the big players are the ones driving or at least end up owning the innovation and Microsoft being a really good example. Google feels like they're a trailer right now, but I mean, obviously they've been invested in this for since their founding, really. And then you see Adobe, like, I don't think they took a stock hit from the Figma being broken up by Britain, by the way, which is interesting, because it almost seemed like they needed Figma when they made the acquisition, and now it seems like they've done fine. 
Yeah, it will be interesting to see how that works. But if it will hurt Figma more or Adobe more, that is indeed a bit of, of a challenging question. But I would say that Adobe is probably further in the AI game than Figma is. And maybe they think that what some of the strengths that Figma has might be recovered by including more AI solutions into their own portfolio without then needing to spend a couple of dozen billion to buy their competitor. So it strikes me that it's really the investment, right? That you got to buy GPUs, you got to buy just a ton of compute. And obviously the companies leading are the ones with all the compute already. And they're the, happen to be the biggest companies in the world. It's a mix of, let's say, compute, but also having the AI talent around people. So let's say, I think around this point last year, the estimated number was that there are around 500 large language model experts around the world and probably around 400 of those sitting in the US, uh, 200 with OpenAI, and then others split around. But of course, this number is growing. But you also know, of course, the amount of money that is paid for talent. So if you are coming as an fresh from one of the top US universities or one of the top EU universities with, let's say, a PhD focusing on large language models that has been well recognized, if you are working in the U.S. at salaries somewhere between 500000 and a million, which is something not happening in Europe whatsoever or at all. So there is just massive investment also on talent going in the U.S., which cannot be met by the type of funding that your typical European startup has. Yeah, like I don't know why anybody's going into investment banking. Go west to AI, young man. You're targeting a bit different people with let's say, the very technical AI work and uh, the very business-style investment banking work. But of course, if you are a top mass PhD, if you start as a quant somewhere in New York, your salaries will also be, oh, I would call it okay. Just a couple of hundred thousand right out of university is fine. You'll be getting by. Yes. You're not eating ramen, right? Not anymore, no. <laughs> <laughs> so it does feel like the big guys, now this will obviously democratized to some extent, but are we seeing something where really the startup scene isn't going to be the key to the future of this? It's really the big guys. Well, I mean, a lot of the inspiration is coming from the startup scene, I would say. So it's still shocking to me how this 10-person startup called MidJourney is still producing the best image-generating AI out there by quite a bit. So Adobe hasn't caught up, OpenAI hasn't caught up, Google hasn't caught up. So if you have the right level of data and the right talent with you, you do not need that many resources to be competitive. And you have similar things around video with Pika, you have Lumen for 3D AI. And it's just that a lot of these startups are having are very flexible and are able to really make their idea work in a really short amount of time which still, okay, as I mentioned that the big ones are almost reaching the speed of some of the startups right now, how they are modifying their products, but in generating new ideas, I think they are still not there. So, I mean, Amazon, Microsoft, Google, I mean, they all have 10,000s of AI engineers, but they're kind of more like uh, in the size of which those companies are. It's more like a government agency at some point it feels like where you have to follow through a lot of procedures in order to get new ideas out there or get new ideas across and yeah i mean that is why the startup world is there if you want to get your idea quickly just invest a lot and then one of the big ones might take a little bit of the huge piles of money they are sitting on and buy you yeah unless britain says no so obviously a lot of questions and accurate predictions on 23 so coming now that we're in 24 or 25 what are you looking at? What are the kind of questions and predictions you're making now? So let's say if my crystal ball is not losing me, I think that right now we will see that while these tools are rolled out right now a bit across the big office suites, the cloud tools, etc., I think that we will see a trickle down of generative AI use also in a lot of smaller things. You start using in, in pixel phones, you can start using image manipulations on your images. So it really touches more the hands of the user. We will see a lot of Gen AI application in the smartphone sector in particular. So smaller, more condensed large language models and chatbots, then a better version of Siri or Google Assistant that will start working on your phones. I think we will also see, yeah, let's say in the professional domain that 
large investment companies, financial sector companies, insurance companies will include more and more LLM style reasoning technologies into their workflows in order to increase their operational efficiency. All of this right now, I think, is more in the experimentation or the proof of concept stage, but we will see it moving into production in 24 or 25. In the public sector, I think the main applications we will probably not see in 24, but a little bit about further down the line. But then I would expect that we will see a lot of more advanced chatbots coming up, a more advanced digitalization tools that yeah, let's say take away a lot of the paperwork or ensure that your services are provided much faster. But I don't expect completely new government services to pop up, that AI support will be more embedded. And as I'd say, as for the long shot, I'm not sure if 24 or early 25, I think we will have the first simultaneous translation, Babelfish style tools that will allow us to, yeah, so I could finally talk German instead of being forced into this English language every time. But I really think that it's not that far away, so you already have video translation tools, but it's not quite real time yet. But I think that probably towards the end of this year or early in the coming year, at least some chat video call tool that does real time translation will be out there. But I'm not sure if it will be one of the big ones or if that is a startup that is trying to, let's say, take the scene from Zoom, Google Meet or the others. Yeah. I can't wait till it's live in the field where you got it like. It can project something or whatever. I, I mean, we travel a lot and that would be awesome. Yeah, like I see sort of a couple of things you're saying there. It feels like there's going to be this bifurcation of, at least on the LLM side, where you're going to get a lot more sophisticated multimodal LLMs at the top. So it's still like, can I upload like the numbers from my company and do analysis right now? Yes, if I know how to use the code interpreter, blah, blah, blah. But that's going to get easier and easier. And it'll just do it for me. That's, of course, going to get easier and more integrated. So, I mean, right now, the Microsoft Copilot is right now more restricted to Office. But could it be in your Windows Search, in your Windows Explorer? Sure. There's nothing that prevents that from happening on the technical level. Or like when I ask ChatGPT to write code, will it actually then load the code so I don't have to know about where I have to put the Python script, blah, blah, blah. So it just does stuff. So I think we see that happening at the big LLM. And then I really see, I think what kind of gave me the picture of the future was the GPT thing from ChatGPT, where you could start building these personalized bots and upload. Now, I don't think that works very well right now. Like I've been struggling with them and they don't seem to learn. Because I think they're just sort of like a vector database, but not like a learning model. It is... No, they are not a self-learning model. Whatever you have to do, you have to retrain them to put it into your vector database. I mean, but the nice part is that I just see it like mini RPA within the JetGPT environment. So if you have to use the same 25 prompts a couple of times or often for your work, you don't have to do it in the main environment. You can create a GPT that does a lot of this automated prompting. So I think it's more like a scripting thing that's something that is super integrated. But... I think that probably Microsoft will release something to the public that will allow you to do various interesting things in your Windows works desktop environment on automating, let's say, document, taking documents, putting it to an LLM, creating code, then executing the code somewhere and you get the feedback from somewhere. So like power automate style. And I do see this probably movement to kind of like whether you call them LLMs or whatever, but like some kind of GPT that is somewhat of a learning model, right? That will learn your style or your thing, or I can upload all the content I've written about AI and we'll start talking like Alan on AI, right? Yeah. I mean, for that, we already have the techniques of fine tuning, but we also have this increasingly large context sizes where you say where you could even because if you can put in 1000 pages at one time let's say or oh, here are my the 800 best pages i've written and now just my prompt of what i actually want to do but please do it in the style of what i did before so like say these things are quite common because the training of llms is still something of very high complexity so a retraining llm 
that will be a tough call with the compute that we currently have on our hands. But for, let's say, smaller condensed model, doing some fine tuning for your style, that is becoming quite feasible. A couple of people have done that, but they have then fine tuned a model for a couple of days with their two, three, four GPUs that they have at home. So a fine tuning that works fine, but to really personal models that are fully retrained on your content, that is something where I'm not sure if it's needed. Fine tuning should be enough for the most part or, or specific prompting, but it's something that is still a couple of years out. So it's not on my 24 crystal ball. Gotcha. And it sounds to me like the other thing you're kind of talking about is the change in the UI of AI. So it's embedded into your phone, into an app, into Microsoft. So it's no longer going to ChatGPT or trying to get on mid-journey's Discord. Nobody wants to do. Yes, I think that that is right now the biggest detractor from even more broad use of AI that the user experience is often quite disconnected. So Copilot already feels very different from using ChatGPT. It's still not as integrated as, okay, I mean, there's still... <laughs> further opportunities for improvement, but at least it's integrated more into the tools that you use every day anyway. And we will see such integration in many, many different tools that are on the generating content part, be it from TikTok filters that are Jet AI powered to, let's say, your assistants on smartphones. And I think they will certainly leverage some LLM technologies later in the year. Yeah. Any prediction on, do you think Google is going to be able to do the leapfrog at some point? It feels like this latest Gemini release was a little bit of a dud. The thing is that they released, uh, they announced before actual release. So Gemini Pro, so this intermediate range version is that is out right now and can be tested, seems to be on par with GPT 3.5 for the most part, depending on how you test it. And Pro is like a limited like set of parameters and count. So it's not using quite as much compute. Yeah, it's a much smaller model, which you can see in the speed. So it's, it's very fast and therefore, you know, it must be something smaller because GPT-4 is still quite slow, even after many, many optimization cycles. But the competing model to GPT-4, that is Gemini Ultra, has not been released to the public yet. So we only see, saw the benchmarking numbers from Google. And so we are still waiting for that to become available via API to see if they are really kind of matching up. And then, of course, there are, you know, say the open source initiatives, Mistral planning bigger and bigger models that should hopefully also go into the direction. Meta, of course, also will be working on Llama 3 and so on to, let's say, meet the cognitive abilities of GPT-4, which I think they probably will be able to do sometime this year because they all have compute, they all have a lot of smart people at their hands, and it's not the big mystery of what has happened. It has a lot to do with selecting the right data and throwing enough compute at it, and then be having the ability to run such a large model at scale, which is amazing that OpenAI managed it this quickly as a startup. But I think that the others will catch up, and those, as I say, the bigger, the more cognitive enhanced LLMs. And on the other end, we probably will see very small condensed LLMs like Gemini Nano from Google was one of them that they announced that can run on your smartphone because they are so small while still being quite smart. But of course, not GPT 3.5 and not GPT 4 smart. But for specific tasks, things that you would normally do on a phone, formulating text messages, responding to emails, screening your calls, etc., they are probably good enough for that. And I think that we will see those in one of the next Android and iOS releases. Yeah, that'll be fascinating. Well, it'll be a question of how closely Apple is going to be able to follow up. That is indeed a question, or if they finally have to take some of their mountain of money and buy somebody interesting. Buy somebody, if they can. And it seems like Google might need to get some PR people from Apple. I don't know, but it's amazing to me. It must be odd for Google to be getting lapped by Microsoft on PR. It's indeed a different world from when I grew up, yes. <laughs> In terms of, of who's the front runner and who's following behind, but it will be very, very interesting to, to follow. I mean, there was also the discussion that the real capabilities of LLMs might be countering Google's business model, which is serving ads as far as possible. So yeah, who knows? It will be interesting to see. It's still quite early days in the AI race. So there is no clear winner. And there is even not saying that there can only be one winner. I mean, in the end, all of the big tech companies might have improved products by AI, but we are still 
using their product anyway. So let's see. Well, excellent. Well, this has been awesome. And I really appreciate you being on. Hopefully, maybe we'll have you back in 2025 to see how these predictions ended up. But we really appreciate you being on the pod today. Thanks for having me. It was really nice talking to you. And thanks for giving me the opportunity to use my U.S. vacation to also do recordings of U.S. podcasts. Yeah, so Jace is in a basement in Wisconsin. So he is not, in fact, in Luxembourg. So... We will wish him safe travels uh, back whenever he's headed home. Thank you for that. AI, Government and the Future is brought to you by Corner Alliance. To find out more about Corner Alliance and how we work with government to create results, visit our website at corneralliance.com and then make sure to search for AI, Government, Future in Apple Podcasts, Spotify and Google Podcasts or anywhere else podcasts are found and click subscribe so you don't miss any future episodes. On behalf of the team here at Corner Alliance, thanks for listening.